Okay, Michael, um, thank you for joining me. Today we're going to cover substantial form. Last time we covered primary matter, and now we're going to cover substantial form. And as we did in primary matter, if you recall, we began with uh, uh, you know, the etymology uh, of, uh, of matter in Greek. I want to do the same, but not actually not so much go back to the Greek etymology of, uh, of form, but actually start by exploring a little bit how we use form in modern language. And, um, and then see that we see in our usage of the word form um, things that relate to the concepts in which we use the term form in, in philosophy. So, you know, form in modern language is used in, in different ways. Um, first, you can talk, you know, we talk about geometric forms, you know, the triangle, the circle, the square, you know, that sort of thing. Or we can talk about literary forms. Uh, or musical forms, that sort of thing. And that conveys the idea of, of a kind, you know, a, a kind of thing. Um, even geometric forms themselves are kinds of things. So a triangle, you see one triangle, it's just one representative of triangularity. Because in, in the physical world, every triangle would be different and maybe not perfect and so forth. So, so, so that's, that's one, one meaning for form. Another one is uh, the cherished uh, ritual on uh, April 15th of fill filling out f forms. You know, this is the IRS form, or we, we fill out forms all the time. And when we fill out a form, I, I mean, I don't know that that's where the, you know, the origin of, of the usage of the word form here is, but, but I know that we put our, our name, we put our identity, we identify ourselves in the form. So, so perhaps in the form, there's this concept of identity in that use of uh, filling out a form. Um, form is in the word formal, and formal can be in a way orderly or perhaps defined, you know, well-defined, you know, formal, you know, formal lines in a tuxedo, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, then there, there's the word formation, which if I reflect on it, to me, there are two... Uh, uh, two aspects of it. One would be, you know, formation, like these airplanes are flying in formation, which uh, goes back to the geometric concept, you know, of, of, uh, of a shape, of a certain, you know, shape or, or form. But there's also another uh, uh, use of the term formation, uh, meaning education in a way. We talk about the formation of students. Or we can talk about the formation perhaps of moral conscience, right? The ethicists will talk about the formation of conscience. And that uh, brings out an aspect of becoming, right? Formation. And then the word education is important, as we will see uh, in a little bit, because uh, um, we will use the, the root of uh, the term education uh, when we talk about uh, substantial form in just a, just a little bit. So, so there's this, this concept of becoming. Um, information, of course, um, is an important one. Now, the term the information itself in its current, you know, in, in this particular construction is hardly ever used by, uh, by the scholastics. It's kind of a modern thing. We don't see that in the uh, scholastic uh, text or whatnot. I thought I would give it my own little definition. You know, information is that by, by which we know a, a thing, right? And information is that by which we know perhaps, but, but that's, that's one, one way in, in, in which the, the root term formation is, you know, pervades our language. Performance is another one, performance. And again, I, 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 I give it maybe performance is that by which we show what we are, right? It's a way of demonstrating what we are through a performance. Um, but anyway, I mean, the bottom line is that form in modern language retains, uh, Meaning, a uh, meaning related to different things: specification, determination, identity, and becoming. And these meanings are found in the philosoph philosophical use of the term "form," uh, as we will see. You know, in, in in our philosophy of nature. Okay, so specification, determination, identity, becoming. And we've seen that before already when we uh, when we've covered uh, whether it's accidental form or substantial form so far. So the definition of substantial form. Uh, you know, the one by, by Aquinas, that by which the thing is what it is, all right? So, for example, the form dog is that by which Fido is dog. So what makes Fido a dog is the form of dog. So it's that by which the thing is, is what it is. 
uh, and that that goes for any anything any substance um, uh, another uh, definition would be that which actualizes matter because form makes matter to be actual and to be this kind of thing as opposed to that kind of thing. Um, another one, I don't want to dwell on it, is the first act of a physical being. That, that's a, a, a phrase that is used by the scholastics, the first act of a physical being. I just mentioned it now because later on we will cover what is called the second act of a being. Um, but the first act is really the first thing that makes a, a being come into existence as such. Okay, so the first act of a physical being. We can call form the principle of determination, right? What makes the being be that be that. All, all these are, are essentially the, uh, the same. And the bottom line is something we've mentioned before, forms are incomplete principles of being and becoming. Okay, now where do forms come from? Um, forms are not in a world of forms. So for anyone familiar with Platonic philosophy, uh, Plato had had a similar idea as Aristotle about forms, and he called them, you know, either he called them forms or he called them ideas. But for Plato, there was a separate realm, a realm where the ideas were, and it was separate from matter. And here, down here below on Earth, in the material world, uh, the forms were incarnated in 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 matter, and uh, but but the forms themselves came from a separate world. And that's not the case um, for Aristotle. And also for Aristotle, forms are not generated. So they don't belong to a separate world. They are not generated for the same reason as we talked about uh, for prime matter, uh, because uh, you get into an infinite regress if you invoke the generation of a form. You, you need to invoke an agent that generates the form and the agent itself is composed of form and, and matter and so forth and at infinity form for Aristotle are in the potency of matter. So that's the expression that, you know, we can use there in the potency of matter, um, which we have to be careful not to think of forms as being distinct little things that, you know, are hiding in matter. But this is a way of expressing the fact that matter is in potency to everything, everything and therefore matter is in potency to every form and forms are in the potency of matter. And we will see now how, how that works in, in, in practical terms. But, but that's the expression that we will use there, in the potency of matter. And during substantial change, forms are educed from the potency of matter to, to come in act, okay? And educed is, is a word that, to understand that word, we, it's in distinction to introduce, because introduce means they are brought from, from without and put into matter, okay? So if you were a, a Platonist, you would say, well, the forms are, you know, come from the world of form and, and get into matter. Now, for an Aristotelian, they are uh, educed. And the only way I can describe educed is by moving my fingers like this and say they, you know, they essentially come in act from the potency of matter. Okay, and that's where the, 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 the relationship between educed and the word that I used earlier, education, right? Education is to bring out in the student something that is, you know, within the student, you know, within the, the potency of the student. The, the student is, is capable of, of learning, and then the process of education brings out in the student the knowledge. So here, so forms are induced, uh, educed, educed from the potency of matter. So the next few slides I'm going to spend on this Eduction, eduction of forms and, and show a little bit how that works. So what happens is under the influence of an agent, a substance is altered, okay? And then the alteration or the, the succession of alterations, the alteration changes the disposition of matter so that the matter is no longer apt or disposed to its present form, but is apt for or disposed to a new form. Okay, and then at that point, a new form is educed from, the, from potency to act, and the old form is reduced to the potency of matter. Okay, so that's, that's the process of substantial change, and that's how forms come to be in act from the potency of matter. Okay, so let's, let's take an example. Let's start with a substance, a subject. We have a tree, this is an elm tree. We're going to have an agent, the agent, and this is the, uh, the Dutch elm, um, 
uh, bug uh, beetle, you know, it, it's, it's the agent. And then we're going to see the, the next substance, which is the stump. Okay, so if we start with the agent and the subject, the agent will cause alterations in the subject. Okay, and when, when the, the, the agent causes alterations, which are really accidental changes in the subject, because so far the subject is still there. Okay, the agent is altering the subject. The matter, the disposition of the matter changes. Okay, and then at some point, boom, the matter is no longer disposed to the form of uh, elm tree, but is disposed to the form of stump. So we have a new subject, we have the eduction okay, of the new form, stump, and we have the reduction of the form of tree or elm tree back into the potency of matter. Okay, so that's, that's how forms are, you know, come to be in, in act from the potency of matter. Now that can happen, you know, doesn't have to be, happen very slowly. It can happen very fast. You know, this is the fast version. You have the tree, you have the thunder, you have the lightning, and boom, you have eduction of a new form of ash, you know, uh, immediately. But the principle is the same, is that there's an alteration, right, in the tree. There's a change in the disposition of the matter, which is a concept we had covered last time uh, uh, at the end when we talked about, you know, matter being disposed in a certain way to certain forms. So there's a change in the disposi disposition of the matter and then there's uh, an eduction of a new form and a reduction of the old form, okay? Now that question of the disposition, disposition of the matter, we'll get into it more when we talk about, uh, when we get into the relationship between uh, the elements uh, that compose the substance and the substance, okay? But for the time being, I just wanted to, to leave it at that, okay? That the matter somehow is changed, its disposition is changed by, by the agent and then and then you have a substantial change and an eduction of a new form. Okay, so that's um, that's what's happening in our um, in our changing world um, constantly. So it's not that the form. Um, so all of these existing things are things that uh, exist in act by virtue of their respective forms. But whenever there is a change, whatever form you know there is goes back into the potency of matter. And it's not that it resides in any specific corner of, of the planet. It's just in the potency of matter. Okay. And, and likewise, prime matter permeates all these exi exi existing things. But prime matter itself is not, you know, residing any particular place or, or, or anywhere in general. Okay. And this whole, you know, world of, of existing things, you know, changes, interchanges um, uh, from one thing to the next. Okay, um, so to go back here, eduction of forms under the influence of an agent, the presence substance is altered. The alteration changes the disposition of the matter so that the matter is no longer apt uh, for its present form, but is apt for a new form. And then a new form is reduced from the potency to act and the old form is reduced to the potency of matter. Okay, so um, something that we're gonna talk about, uh, some properties of form, again, they do not exist on their own. Forms do not have, just like matter, forms do not have quantitative parts or extension, right? A form of a dog, the form of the dog is not itself, you know, two feet or three feet or, you know, it's just because forms do not exist per se, okay? And forms do not increase or decrease. Uh, Aristotle say that forms do not increase or decrease and he, he likens forms to numbers. Um, the way to explain that is that if, um, you cannot be any more dog or any less dog, okay? You are dog or you are a tree, or you are a human being. There are no degrees, right? Form does not accept, accept of different degrees of, of being uh, in its being, okay? And Aristotle says it's like number because number one is number one. Anything over one is no longer one, okay? And then you have two, that sort of thing. So, so forms do not increase or decrease, okay? And do not have quantitative parts or extensions. Uh, but forms have a relationship to quantity. Um, just like last time we talked about the relationship between prime matter and quantity, forms, at least it's, it's, it's from observation, it seems that forms limit the quantity of the natural things that they actualize, okay? Because a dog will 
generally range, you know, between certain quantities. And it's not going to be, you know, if you see a dog that is, you know, 50 feet uh, in size, it's a monster. It, it's not a dog. I mean, we, we're going to appreciate that as being uh, a monstrosity. Uh, this is not something that, you know, we, we necessarily have to hold to... Um, dogmatically because it's not necessarily it's, it's more of an empirical fact that, that we see that that things seem to be uh, to have a certain range in size that that is natural to them and it's not by virtue of matter that they have a range in size because in fact you know it's through matter that they will increase or, or decrease but form will limit the quantity of the natural thing that they actualize okay so so it's by virtue of forms that certain things are of, of, of a given range of sizes. Okay. Um, substantial form is in the whole substance. Okay. So the substantial form of dog is everywhere in the dog. It's not um, more in the brain of the dog or in the tail of the dog or in the paw of the dog. Okay. The, the form of dog is everywhere in the dog. Okay. It's the co-principle of being of each part of a thing. Okay. And that's very important because as we will see later on, the substantial form really is what gives every, uh, it's the principle of unity in things, okay? Things are, are one thing by virtue of their substantial form and, and by virtue of the fact that the form is everywhere in that thing, okay? Um, and, and otherwise, if, if it was distributed within the thing, things differently, it wouldn't be a single thing. And we will talk later on about the distinction between artifacts and natural substances and how natural substances have an, an intrinsic substantial unity that artifacts do not have okay so substantial form is everywhere in the thing it's in you know my form of human being is in my my toe as much as it is in my ears and in my brain okay it's not distributed any particular way um, later on when we talk about uh, organisms and living organisms and animals and whatnot the operations that follow from a given form, you know, may be specific to certain organs and certain parts, okay? But the form itself is present everywhere in the, in the substance, okay? And form is the principle of operation. I'm not gonna dwell on this much here. This is something we will go over later on, but substantial form is the principle of operation. The principle of, uh, of operation, and here we're gonna talk about when, when things move. Okay, when any a given substance move internally or intrinsically or changes itself, okay, the form is going to be the principle of, of operation of that thing. A thing acts the way it does because of the kind of being that it is, okay? So if a dog barks and moves and chases after rabbits and, and, uh, and, and that sort of thing, it's because of the substantial form of dog, okay? It's, it's the form of dog that is the principle of operation that that makes the dog act in a way that, that it does. And for us, that's um, as, as a sentient being, because all our knowledge comes through the senses, we, we, we get to the concept of form through the way things act, right? It's because we can distinguish the different actions of a dog that we can tell that a dog is a different kind of thing and has a different form than a cat or a tree or a brick of gold and that sort of thing. Okay, all of this we'll get into later on, but I, I just wanted to to bring that up here, and um, and that's about it. So that covers substantial form in its broad outline. The most important thing here is to understand um, that um, uh, that whoops, sorry, that um, how do I stop sharing? Here we go. Stop sharing. Okay. To understand that, uh, you know, forms are not, you know, elsewhere and introduced in matter. Okay. But there are, so this material world con contains, you know, all the forms and, and everything interchanges and you have that sort of, uh, that intermingling and the form divorces matter here and then re, you know, uh, remarries a different you know matter there and that sort of thing i mean you have this this marriage between matter and form that is constant and takes place um in this particular way any does that any any questions at this point uh, about this 
I'm going to tell you what's what's coming up next. At least that I'm thinking about it. I'm uh, next. I think it may be a good time to a little bit uh, pause on what we've covered so far and contrast this with um, different uh, uh, ways, perhaps, of, about of thinking about how the world might be organized. You know, a, a more mechanical, atomistic way would be one way, uh, and contrast that with a hylomorphic way, and 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 perhaps see where the uh, there may be shortcomings with uh, with a reductionist approach, and and then I, I would talk briefly about what seems to be coming up now in science more and more is this concept of emergence emergentism, right? So emergence of 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 properties, you know, with complexity, that sort of thing. But but here on this question of of uh, substantial form, um, do you have any uh, any anything to ask or? I don't think so. Okay. All right. Well, on that note, then we'll we'll stop here, and uh, and then next time we'll we'll uh, w uh, as I said, I think we'll contrast uh, hylomorphism, the, the the idea of a substance in hylomorphism, as opposed to how it's explained in uh, in uh, reductionism uh, or mechanism, and it has to do with the relationship between parts and holes. All right, thanks, Michael. See you in a okay. bit. Bye. <laughs>